When delving into the world of alternative history, it's important that one does not get lost in the tartar sauce. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. This is part two, and I, I would recommend going back and watching part one first. I just want to get that out of the way, but in case you haven't, here's a quick recap. In a video a couple of weeks ago, we covered specifically the channel Mind Unveiled's version of Tartaria, what that means, what it is, who the Tartarians were supposedly, and basically all of his evidence for it, at least from half of the video. We covered 30 minutes of an hour long video in that because it was that dense. As for why we chose Mind Unveiled's channel, I will reiterate this despite the fact that he leaves it out of his response video, but we chose Mind Unveiled because we asked the Tartaria community who they thought did a good summary. Someone that we could just take one video and go through the points in that and handle it that way without going through every video on a channel. And the most popular result was Mind Unveiled, whose Reddit account constantly is posting videos of Mind Unveiled's channel to that exact subreddit, so I felt, you know, that makes sense. Also, in his summary video, he uses a stream from Charlie, Moist Critical, that I appear in, so it just kind of made sense. To briefly respond to something that was said in Mind Unveiled's response video, I did not choose your video because I was salty that Charlie didn't choose my 59 second short to understand what Tartaria is. And speaking of that last video, I want to address some things because this turned into drama and I really didn't expect it to. Many people in the comments accused me of picking the most insane possible YouTuber on this subject. That was both on Reddit and here on YouTube. I just explained why I picked Mind Unveiled and I've been looking into other people like Robert Seffer, who people seem to have a much higher opinion of. So I'll be looking at that as well because apparently Mind Unveiled is out there and fringe. I was also accused of not doing my own research. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean, but I have the notepad right here, and I promise you Aiden's not doing the research. He has another day job. But to prove that I do, in fact, have all 88 pages of handwritten notes, I'm going to post the scans publicly on Patreon, so you'll be able to see it without subscribing. There was also a point made about how this theory tends to lean into anti-Semitism in some cases, and that Mind Unveiled does use a couple of those points. Now, people claimed that I was accusing him of anti-Semitism without the appropriate evidence, so I'm gonna leave that out of this video so people can focus on, you know, all of the points I'm debunking and not this, the, the notion that this may be a little racist. I'll say I am willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he himself does not hold anti-Semitic viewpoints, but the theory does go there often, and not necessarily his version of it, but there, there are some things that come up in his sources that are pretty rough. One example of this would be that Michael Sarian, somebody he cites quite often, says basically that World War II is misunderstood and that the Germans weren't necessarily the bad guys in the way that we think, which, huh? Also, because it has been publicly commented now, and I did, I do have receipts, uh, when I did ask him publicly about his opinion on the Holocaust, he said that he needed to do more research and they had never done a video on it, so he didn't know. And to be abundantly clear, I have reached out to him privately to clarify his position and he has since refused. And a few people said that I was condescending in that video, and I will admit that there were a few moments where I probably did sound a little condescending or arrogant. That said, most of the people saying that I was condescending or arrogant didn't actually watch my video and just watched Mind Unveiled's version of it and admitted to that. But I do know that I have, in my life, had a tendency towards, you know, arrogance and a big ego, and I've worked to remove that from my personality to the best of my ability, but sometimes it does come out, and when somebody claims that the nations of the Holy Roman Empire represented on the coat of arms are actually Phoenician families planted there by the Catholics, including England, despite the fact that England was Protestant and is not on the coat of arms, it's hard to not be condescending. Additionally, there was a, this, this was kind of an in-kind response to how his video was done, and there are a few quotes in here where I'll point out exactly when he said something that came across to me as a little smarmy. Two of those particular comments in, that I covered in the last video were one where he's basically like, come on guys, we don't really believe that Ben Franklin did that thing with the key, right? All because Franklin was a Mason. Not, not anything to do with the possibility that the story is apocryphal, it's just that because he was a Mason. The other one is when he's like, come on guys, do you really think that people could build star forts like this on sand in only 1800? And it's like, yeah, sand is actually pretty shallow to the bedrock, and they removed the sand and then built a lumber foundation and then built the fort on top of that. So there, there's some condescension in his video as well. I just wanted to make that clear. So not saying that I'm a saint or perfect, but just saying that he's not in a position to talk. So with the criticisms from my last video and my explanation for how I feel about them out of the way, let's actually get into the definition of Tartaria and how Mind Unveiled seems to argue that history works. So according to Mind Unveiled on their 
channel, I've realized this is actually two people now, but according to their channel, this is the largest conspiracy, that's his word by the way, conspiracy in the world. Perhaps even larger than Flat Earth, which by the way, his Reddit suggests he believes in as well. And he claims that this begins, this whole theory begins with all of our taught history being a lie. Now there's an immediate problem here, which is that history at the professional level is not taught, it is studied. We take documents, artifacts, we talk with anthropologists and archaeologists, linguists, geneticists, all sorts of different groups, and the goal is to, using the evidence available, construct a coherent narrative for what happened in history. And I'm not saying fake a narrative, I'm saying actually present what we believe happened based on the available evidence. So it's studied in that historians ask a question, gather evidence, take notes, analyze, discuss, publish their work, and then it is reviewed by other historians. So in no way is it that at the professional level, historians are just reading a textbook. And then we've got to address his definition for Tartaria because it's not what you might expect. When you hear somebody say Tartaria, you might think that they're talking about a specific landmass and its history. The term, according to Mind Unveiled, is a little bit more broad than that. And it goes as follows. The phenomena or category of alternative history that delves into the research of lost history and civilizations, hijacks and stolen buildings, magic, alchemy, and cloning, antiquitech, cataclysms, mud floods, buried buildings, buildings, star forts and fortified cities, royal bloodlines and secret brotherhoods, asylums, orphans and odd fellows, underground tunnels and waste management, and suppressed Moorish history. Now, as you can tell, that is a, a lot of things involved in this definition, which meant a lot of time sitting at my desk, or more appropriately, sitting and standing using my FlexiSpot E7 desk that I was given by FlexiSpot for this ad slot. And I gotta say, as far as ads go, as far as companies go that have paid us to do stuff, I love FlexiSpot. Their product is so good, it is so easy to use, easy to put together. I use it every single day. It has made my Twitch streaming life even better because I can sit there and you know, sometimes when I'm playing with a controller, I want I want my hands a little different spot. I want my chair a little lower. I can just move the desk to match. It doesn't, I don't need to do anything myself. FlexiSpot is also really, really affordable. These are very high quality desks that do not go for the very high quality desk price that you see at some of the bigger stores. You might look at 1,000, 1,500 for a standing desk somewhere else, but FlexiSpot keeps it in the mid hundreds. It's very affordable and very reasonable. And in fact, I love my FlexiSpot desk so much that we decided to give one away to you guys. So the way we're gonna do that is that if you go down to the description here, there's a handy little link to a Google form. You're gonna fill that out with your name, your email, and then we will make sure to randomly select somebody. And one of you will be getting a brand new FlexiSpot desk shipped directly to your door. If you'd like to try the FlexiSpot E7, click the link in the description and use the code YTB50 to get $50 off any order over $500. And let me say, I, I am very grateful for the desk because it was involved in making this video. And speaking of the video, Mind Unveiled, I will give him credit, he does say that there are surely some truths sprinkled in, and I would argue that there's more than some, and he very, very much overestimates the lies. Additionally, I find it very interesting that this is all constructed around the Catholic Church lying to people, and yet he never once mentions the donation of Constantine, which is probably the most famous lie ever told by the Catholic Church. We'll get to the exact details of what the donation of Constantine was and what it was used for later, but it's very odd that something so obvious was not mentioned. And it's odd that it wasn't mentioned despite the fact that it's in Sarian's book. Like, I read the- I, I bought it. I bought actually all of the books that he uses here. But let's start with the fabricated history and stolen cities. And I will say at times this does kind of veer out of the original topic that I chose because the way that his video works, it, it doesn't always remain on the exact topic. But he says, what Tartaria boils down to is fabricated history and stolen cities. And then he suggests that New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Charleston, Tampa, all of these different major US cities were all actually built by the Tartarians and were already here when the European colonists arrived. He's claiming that these buildings are being recycled, that they were already there and dug out of the mud after the mud flood, which yes, we'll get to the mud flood too. Now, as far as the actual building examples he gives for talking about this, we did cover that in the last video. So on screen right now, you should see the photos from the last video that we were talking about. All of these have perfectly reasonable explanations. Nobody was digging a building out of the ground. At about three minutes, 11 seconds in this video, however, he shows us the Rua del Setembro in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And once again, he 
he uses a very blurry, low-resolution version of the image, despite the fact that high-resolution ones are very, very, very much available on the internet. This is something he actually does on numerous occasions throughout the video, is he shows a very, very low-quality image and suggests that, you know, that's the only version we have. In the photo, he has what appears to be a utility pole circled in red, as well as the spire from an adjacent building across the street, and looking at it, it does look like there's no wires attached to the utility pole, but that's just because of the quality of the photography. We're going to be talking about a photo later in this very video where it's taken a little bit closer to the utility pole, and you can see the lines, but they're very faint, so it's very possible that the reason there's no lines attached to that utility pole is just that the camera wasn't of a high enough quality to capture it. But because there are no wires, he claims that it is collecting atmospheric energy. At 335, he shows a photo that the website Piercing the Veil of Illusion has labeled as Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's being excavated. This is a problem because the picture is actually of Marseille, France. It was taken by an Adolphe Thierry during expansions and renovations of the city in 1863, and uh, I was told I don't do my own research. But this photograph is not of North Carolina. It's not even in America. It is France. Do you know how much pain I'm in having to use France for my argument? Next, he shows us the Oriental Hotel in Dunedin, which is in uh, New Zealand, not the United States. Just from looking at the picture, it's pretty clear that what happened was they dug into the hillside to build this building, and that it was not dug out of the mud. This is partially because it was a lumber structure that actually caught on fire four different times before they finally decided to demolish it because it was a fire hazard that could have burned down the entire town. According to Mind Unveiled, all of this old world architecture seems to be made out of stone. And as I said, it, it was only standing for like 20 years. It was built in 1863 and demolished in 1887. But then we move on to a, an example that's not just a background photo, it's something he actually talks about. And that, of course, is Tampa Bay, or the city of Tampa. The first thing he mentions is that there are tunnels underneath most major U.S. cities, and in this case we're talking specifically about the Ebor Tunnel underneath Tampa. Now, those tunnels aren't really that much of a mystery to historians, as he claims that they are, and he says that historians claim they were prohibition tunnels meant to smuggle alcohol, but the article he has on screen as support for this entire thing very, very clearly says that historians think they were sewers. Now, in that article, it does say that it's entirely possible that people did use these tunnels to smuggle alcohol, but it seems pretty clear that these were sewer tunnels. So his whole mainstream history, mainstream historians are all lying to you thing doesn't really work here because mainstream historians aren't saying the things he's claiming they are. And according to the article, those tunnels were built in the 1880s, and if they were built in the 1880s, it makes complete sense that they would have been new sewers, because we were just starting to build industrial urban sewers at that time. Additionally, newer pipes are down there that were installed as late as the 70s or 80s. So, either the city misplaced records about the construction of the tunnels, or Tartaria was still in existence well into Reagan's presidency. That was, that's what it was. Reagan destroyed Tartaria. He goes on to say that some of these tunnels are massive and couldn't be built using the technology of the time, but he does not go on to explain what that means or why they couldn't be built using the technology of the time. He does use an image of the Union Canal Tunnel, which is not that far from us, over in, you know, just central Pennsylvania, and it's really not all that impressive up close. They basically dug a ditch and then dug some tunnels through hills and mountains. That's it. It's nothing too impressive. Also, the rock that they had to dig through to make this tunnel was primarily slate, which breaks extraordinarily easily and was also very popular as roofing shingles. So this would have been a dual-purpose project where you would have both the roofing shingles coming out of it, other things slate could be used for, like tiles and countertops, and then on top of that you were also building a canal to connect the Susquehanna to the Schuylkill. The next example is the Washington Street Tunnel in Chicago. I will bring it up how quickly we got off of Tampa. And naturally we get a picture of some lines in the sky with a red circle around it and no context whatsoever. And then I reversed image searched it with both TinEye and Google Lens, and interestingly enough, this is definitely a doctored image. In fact, if you just look at it, it's very clearly a doctored image. The clouds in the sky appear to have been photoshopped in, as well as the lines that are clearly from a utility pole. And he, it's, it's weird that he did this, because the previous image is taken from almost exactly the same angle, and shows no signs of being doctored, and also has buildings in it that are not present in the one that he shows that's doctored. If you look at it, it's very clear that some of these buildings were photoshopped in, that somebody just used the like paintbrush removing tool to get rid of one building and didn't even do a very good job of it, and you can see the utility poles that were photoshopped 
from the previous picture. So it's very obviously a fake image, and the one right before it isn't, and is different. It's just, I don't understand. And I, as I got to this point in my research, I really genuinely could not tell if I felt like this was just deliberate deception or not. The next claim is that there's also a tunnel system under Pensacola, Florida, and that this is being suppressed from the history books because they don't line up with the official PR-approved narratives. He then moves on to claim that there is a massive tunnel system under Pensacola, Florida, and his evidence for this appears to be an article written in a magazine that I was not able to find. But here's how this goes. There is a legend that when the Spanish left Pensacola, they had secret tunnels under the city and they didn't tell anybody where they were. A Mike Henderson, writing for the aforementioned Unnamed magazine, claims that he had been inside and that the entrance was at Fort Barrancas and claims that they lead all the way downtown. Of course, he has never actually gone through them all the way downtown. He was just sure that they led there. Additionally, the tunnels under Fort Barrancas are on TripAdvisor. He also claims as evidence that the nearby naval air station, which has some of these old tunnels under it, has signs that say danger restricted area, and those signs are placed just before the entrances to 236 year old unmaintained tunnels. So clearly there's a conspiracy here. But now we're finally actually back to Tampa Bay, but it's not to talk about tunnels, it's to talk about the Tampa Bay Hotel built by Henry B. Plant. Of course, it is now the Henry B. Plant Museum, and that building was constructed from 1888 to 1891 as part of Plant's ambitions to, to, to dominate the Florida railroad and shipping market. He was, of course, a railroad and steamship magnate, and he had just built a rail line all the way down to Florida. He himself was from New York. And along that rail line, to encourage people to travel on it and use the passenger trains and make him money, he planted a whole bunch of hotels, one of which was the Tampa Bay Hotel. And it's pretty well known in the area that Henry B. Plant is responsible for much of the industrialization of that part of Florida. And Plant's activities were well documented during his life. It's not like this is something that was kind of just written onto a blog or into a textbook later. In fact, we've got articles discussing his business in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle on the 10th of July, 1890, in the St. Louis Globe Democrat on the 6th of March, 1892, and in the Philadelphia Inquirer on the 8th of October, 1885, as well as many, many, many other mentions of Henry B. Plant. Mind Unveiled goes on to claim that this building is actually old world architecture built by the Tartarians, and this is because of the Moorish exterior, Moorish revival, really, and the, uh, the European interior. Now, primary sources from the era that would be, you know, photographs, documents, magazines, newspapers, architectural plans, all sorts of things, all will tell you that back in the late 1800s, what was fashionable in Europe was fashionable in the United States. This was actually basically the case all the way up until World War I. Much of American style, what Americans considered to be the upper class, the upper echelon of life, was taken from Europe. But of course, Mind Unveiled is saying that he doubts this video was built at the time it was claimed, that it's actually Tartarian architecture. He goes on to say, most of the time you'll get a few construction photos, but it's fascinating to find out how poorly documented the construction process was during this time. At this point in the video, he has on screen a very blurry image of the construction of the Tampa Bay Hotel with scaffolding and all of that, that he claims shows it completely built, and there's text on screen, I'll have the picture up on screen, there's text on screen that says that why is this the most high quality image available when we have HD ones, when we should have the HD capabilities? Well, it's not the highest quality one that you can find. In fact, if you go to the very website he's talking about, the photograph is there and you can blow it up into full HD, full screen resolution, and you can actually tell when looking at the full HD version that yes, half of the building has not even reached the full height yet, that it is very much being built and there are people in the photograph, you can tell that the construction process was ongoing. So either he didn't look or he's lying. He also mentions what he calls vanilla skies in the background of the photo, the not detailed kind of just off-white sky. The entire photo is in sepia and it was 1880s photography. And he also mentions that there are a lot of these early cityscape photos that don't show anybody in them why do we have these empty cities? We must have just dug them out of the ground and then populated them later. We'll get to that. But the thing is, when you're trying to get a detailed image of a cityscape on an archaic camera, you're gonna have to have a very long exposure time. And the thing is, people don't really stay in place all that long. So they simply won't show up. The camera will not register due to the old technology, the fact that there were in fact people on the street because they moved too fast for the camera to capture them. 
We can see this in a lot of old photographs where things that are taken at a little bit more of a tight angle, you can see that somebody will be walking and they're perfectly perfectly represented, but somebody else will be running and that person will be blurry. Now, of course, he does mention other clear signs of photo manipulation, but says that that's an entirely different video to avoid, you know, explaining what he means. And very ironically, he actually shows a number of very obviously doctored photos in support of his theory throughout the entire video. He's also very fond of presenting information, questioning its legitimacy, and then just giving reasons why it might be incorrect before moving on, but he never actually makes a point. He, ne he never discusses any evidence. He's just like, do you really believe this? And yeah. He does this with the Ponce de Leon Hotel in Tampa, and it's the one that's the, it's the first building in the United States to be made entirely of poured concrete. And I would show you the clip and the context, but several other creators who have engaged with Mind Unveiled in the past reached out to me to tell me that if I used any of his clips, he'd probably copyright strike me. So I will not be doing that. I'll just timestamp where you can go watch the context. He also notes that these hotels were built with full electricity installed, which is weird because there wasn't much going on in Florida at the time, so we're told. Of course, this is not remotely true, and the idea that people didn't plan cities and didn't actually actively encourage people to move there in the 1800s is wild to me. Like, that's a well-known fact. And as we know, Henry B. Plant, since the 1880s, had been pushing for people to move to Florida, to industrialize Florida, so he could make money on his rail lines and his steamships. And of course, Henry B. Plant was not the only one. There were other people who were at the same level as him, doing the same thing, all over the United States. We'll actually end up talking about one, Charles Broadwater. And I do need to reiterate that this entire theory is predicated upon the belief that all of these images, these buildings, everything about this old world architecture, that it can't be explained. And the problem with that is there's an explanation for every building and there's actually evidence for most of them. It's not just, you know, hey, this is what they said it happened. This is how they said it was built. It's like we have photos of construction or we have newspaper documents talking about it. Like you need a subscription to newspapers.com, but I have one because I do this for a living. You don't solve the boy in the box case without a newspapers.com subscription, you know? Maybe I can use my newspapers.com subscription to read the Philadelphia Inquirer article that doesn't credit us with discovering the identity of the boy in the box's parents two weeks before they read their article. That's cool. His next point is all of the Russian and Turkic style architecture in the United States. Now, this would be a very interesting point if he didn't also call neoclassical, second empire, neocolonial, gothic revival, and basically any other 1800s architecture style, Tartarian. Despite the fact that there is very little, if anything, in common between Moorish architecture and neoclassical. Can also be partially explained by the fact that the global east was starting to join the industrialized world, and so you were getting a lot more influence from countries that previously didn't have much of a say in American events or in culture, history, style, you know, places that were still behind the times in terms of technology, and so just weren't really putting their own culture out as much. It can also be explained partially by the fact that America is a nation of immigrants. One example he gives is the Moorish revival style architecture, the Moorish influenced architecture of the city of Opalaca, Florida. Opalaca, Florida. It might be Opaloka. I've given up with Florida. Today that city is within the urban sprawl of Miami and Fort Lauderdale, you know how that's just kind of one big coastal city but it does maintain its own municipal government. The city itself was actually designed by Glenn Curtis of the Curtis Aircraft Manufacturing Company in 1926. This was during the Florida land boom when all of the work that Henry B. Plant and people like him had done in the 1880s and 90s was dragging a whole lot of people to Florida because suddenly there was stuff there. Now, Mind Unveiled suggests that this architecture is actually considerably older and built by the Tartarians. There's a few problems with that. We have photography of the Miami area before Opalaka was built, and it is not there. And Opalaka differs considerably from the other buildings from Tampa Bay that he shows when you look at them side by side. The Henry B. Plant Museum, that what was once the Tampa Bay Hotel, looks very different from the city hall of Opalaka. But most importantly, it should be mentioned that the University of Miami has a document with before and after pictures showing the construction of Opalaka, Florida, right there on its website. Like, it took me a single Google search to find it. It's got construction photos, plans, articles about it being built, the whole, the whole nine yards. It's not just the one document with the before and after photos, it's a bunch of documents. He also asks if you've ever wondered why it's called St. Petersburg, Florida, but does not ask the same question about Syracuse, New York, or Suffolk, Connecticut. 
or really any other American city named after a European city. Look, I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad argument, I'm just saying that if you're gonna argue based on place names, be consistent. Now, he does go on to mention other cities, but he's not focusing on their names, he's focusing on their architecture. Which, again, I must remind everybody that Moorish architecture and Russian architecture are not the same thing. And the ones he brings up also aren't Russian or even necessarily consistently Moorish. The first one he shows is Central Synagogue, which is in Manhattan, and it features a Moorish Revival exterior with a more European-style interior. Specifically, a, a Neo-Gothic. And before anybody points out that I'm just saying what Wikipedia says, I have a medieval studies degree, I know what neo-Gothic architecture looks like, I didn't need to look that up. But when I did have legitimate questions about the architecture style of a certain building, I called up my buddy, who's a architecture master's student at Columbia. So that's, that's my source. Guy's getting his master's of architecture. And again, this is not a Russian-style building, and he keeps acting like the Russians and the Moors are interchangeable. They're not. They're very different cultures. Next, we get Islam Temple, which is not a Muslim temple at all, but rather a Shriners Temple, which was built in 1917. Now, the Shriners are a part of an appendant body of Freemasonry, which means that you have to be a Master Mason to join, but not all Masons are Shriners, nor do all Masons share the beliefs or mission of the Shriners. Now, if you are one of the people out there who has convinced yourself that the Freemasons are all evil Satanists, this probably won't change your mind, but I know a bunch of Shriners, and they give up their weekends to go and entertain kids at children's hospitals. Like, they dress up like clowns and play with toys with them. It's actually really heartwarming and wholesome. Shriners hospitals also provide care at as low a cost as possible, even free in some circumstances. And just to lay it out there, I am not a Shriner. Now, as far as evidence that it's not older than 1917 goes, an article in The Architect and Engineer of California, dated to September of 1917, a J.F. Dunn writes, In the new shrine temple being created on Geary Street, San Francisco, is found a rare example of a building designed in a historical style. Now, another document about a similar temple by the same name is available online, but to be very clear, that one's in Sacramento, not San Francisco. And I'll give it to him that I couldn't find any photos of its construction, but it was just one of many buildings being built in San Francisco that year, so it's not too surprising there's no photos. And as I said, there there is contemporary documentation that the building was not yet completed, so... And also, just to be perfectly clear, I'm not getting all of this from, like, articles that were written in the last 20 years. I'm going back and I am finding the scans of the original documents that were written in 1917, that were written in 1885. So I'm, I'm looking at the actual document, not somebody transcribing it into something else. I think it's also a good time to mention photography and its evolution, because a lot of the buildings that he brings up were constructed when only daguerreotype photography was available. Now, daguerreotype photography, the gist of it is it it works differently. You're, you're basically etching the image onto a silver plate, which is not the same way that modern photography or the photography that developed after 1854 worked. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I totally understand it, but I'll remember to leave the link to how this works in the description. But the thing about daguerreotypes was that they were difficult to reproduce. Either an artist had to copy it, a photorealistic artist, or you had to take yet another daguerreotype of your daguerreotype. So there aren't a lot of copies. Now, the practice of using cameras that captured on negatives and were then copied to get you the positive, that didn't really come about until after 1854. In fact, it was absolutely not available to the public before 1854. Now, the newer kind of photography were not as precisely detailed as the daguerreotype was, but they were easier to reproduce, considerably. The next example we get is the Farmers and Exchange Bank in Charleston, South Carolina. Because it was constructed before 1854, any photographs of it are likely daguerreotypes, and therefore copies are hard to come by, so I couldn't find any photos of its construction. Also, given how old the city of Charleston is, you can't find photographs of Charleston before there were buildings there. And the area in which that specific building was built is one of the earlier populated areas of Charleston. And he also hits us with the Inad Shriners Temple, which is in East St. Louis, Illinois. But the thing is, if you go on their website, there are photos of it being constructed. You can also find other photos of it being constructed. It's very clearly not, not old world architecture, as he claims. The next example we get is that he claims that old world churches, and I'm, I think he's talking about Romanesque and Gothic revival here, that, se that most of the examples he shows are one of those two things when it comes to churches, but he says they have questionable history as being rebuilt or moved multiple times. 
He directs us to Sacred Heart Catholic Church, which was actually built twice, but for a very good reason. According to the church itself, and on their website, a small church was built there in Tampa, Florida in 1859, and that church served the entire Catholic community of Tampa. But as Plants Railroad and steamships led to more and more growth in the region, they had to build a newer, bigger church to accommodate more and more Catholics. Now, a photo of the construction can be found, but it is pretty obvious that it was touched up by an artist because it seems like it wasn't very high quality to begin with, so I'm not gonna use that as an example simply because he'll just say that it's clearly touched up. But this one can actually be debunked entirely on stylistic grounds because he's made it pretty clear that Moorish Revival and Russian-style architecture, those are the Tartarian buildings. Those are evidence of Tartaria. This is Romanesque Revival. It's not even Romanesque. It is Romanesque Revival. So it can't be Tartarian because it's not a Tartarian architecture style. It's a revival style of a European architecture style from a time period he says didn't happen. There's probably no way I'm getting through this video without being condescending. Guys, I tried. We're, we're, we're 11 pages of notes into this and I've got 37 more. Next up, we have Cornelius Vanderbilt II's Manhattan Mansion, which was constructed in 1883 at 57th and 5th Avenue. Now, there are no photos that I could find of the construction of the building. I did find photos of its demolition, which the demolition shows the wooden frame pretty clearly, but yeah, whatever. Um, the point is, there are photos of that block in 1870, and there is not a mansion there in 1870. In fact, there's several blocks with no permanent buildings at all constructed yet. Now, the photo currently on your screen was taken at 55th and Madison, just a couple blocks over, but you can clearly see the corner of 57th and 5th in the photograph, and there is no mansion there. It's on the far left side. And remember how I gave you timestamps earlier in the video for how far along into his I was? The first one I mentioned was 3 minutes 11 seconds. Look where we are in the video now. The, the length of this video, I'm just hitting what's on screen at 638 in his. Now, the photo that was on screen at 638 was a picture of Market Street in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was taken in 1907, and this is the one that I said you can see the wires on the utility poles, but they're faint, and that that's why the one from Rio de Janeiro, you probably can't see the wires just because the camera didn't pick them up, because that picture was taken between three and ten years later, so... And if you look at the distance from the camera to the utility pole in the picture taken in the 1910s versus the one taken in 1907, that, that was weird. The light just flickered. Anyway, if you look at those two, the Rio one is definitely further away from the utility pole and the, the wires are already faint in the Chattanooga one. It's also a good example of how exposure time affects photography from the late 1800s and early 1900s, because as you can see in the foreground, there is a woman walking and she's pretty clear, but there's also in the middle of the picture a boy running and he is very much not clear. So even as late as 1907, if somebody was running, they were gonna be blurry. And this isn't like an Olympic track star running, this is like a kid jogging down the street who's blurry. Next up is the Manhattan Talmudical Academy, which goes by several names, but that was the easiest one to use. And I'll admit that I can't find pre-construction photos of it, and I also couldn't find photos of it being built. But it was founded in 1916, and photos of the Washington Heights neighborhood where the Talmudical Academy is, taken back in the late 1800s, show it as being not a city block, but much more isolated mansions on large estates. So I couldn't find any pictures that necessarily prove that this building was built in 1916, but based on what Washington Heights was like 30 years prior, it seems unlikely that anything was there. We have pictures of the mansions and these estates, these rolling hills. I, I would argue that you would see more if, if that area had already been developed to the extent they're claiming, you would have seen more construction there. Next up is Eastern State Penitentiary, which is right in Philadelphia, 40 minutes down the road. Now, this prison may look like a castle, and that was a deliberate decision made by the architect to make it more imposing to suggest to criminals that perhaps they don't do crime so they don't end up in the scary dungeon. It was built from 1821 to 1829, so entirely before photography even existed in the United States. I believe in 1829, photography was like a, a novel, brand new thing in France. Now, it is clearly looking at the building, looking at the plans, being inside of it. That building was obviously built as a prison and nothing else. But more importantly, when it was built, it had flushing toilets integrated. 
1829, which is actually pretty impressive. But that's, that's important because Mind Unveiled claims that the Tartarians did not need to eat food. They did not need, they did not need toilets because they didn't need to eat food and that's why there's no toilets in American cities before the 1880s. And he claims that they survived on air somehow and he calls them Breatharians. I didn't even bother with that one, I'm gonna be honest. Because what? At this point, the Tartarians aren't even human anymore. They're, they're something else because our metabolisms need calories. There's, there's physically no way that we could survive without calories breathing air. That's not, no. And I know there is a chance he takes this and he goes, Aiden didn't look into da da da. I'm not, I'm not wasting time on breatharianism. That's not gonna happen. You will not get me there. Then he shows us an image that is clearly from a postcard, which shows a hospital labeled somewhere in Worcester, uh, Massachusetts. I couldn't, like, Tin Eye couldn't find it. It's actually very easy to find St. Vincent Hospital in Massachusetts. That's really easy to do. But for some reason, he chose the blurriest possible version of the photo on the internet. And this point in my notes is where I began to feel like he's probably grifting. I know I said that this was a video about Tartaria, but given the scope of the personal attacks he and his followers have levied against me, I'm, I'm just gonna make that point. It was built as a small 12-bed Catholic hospital that was just serving the Worcester area, and it was built on Vernon Hill or in Vernon Hill. I'll be honest, I didn't look to check if that was a, like, hamlet or what. And it was built in 1893, so the fact that it was that small kind of explains why there's no construction photos of it. It just wasn't a big deal. It also seems possible that the building was not built for the hospital and existed under some other name before that, and I couldn't find any records. It's, it's just one of those things that, like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll give it to you that this one doesn't have photographs of it being constructed. But the style is decidedly not old world, and it's it's actually such a weird style that when I called up my architecture buddy, we both looked at this thing for 15 minutes and neither of us could figure it out because it mixes so many different ones. It's arguably colonial revival mixed with neoclassical and Victorian elements. He then shows us the Army Navy Hospital in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is clearly constructed of wood and not in Moorish or Russian or neoclassical or really any of the architecture styles that he has nailed down as being Tartarian. Now, full disclosure, couldn't find pictures of it being built. I'll be honest, I'll be fair. And I also couldn't find pictures of the location prior to the Army Hospital being there. So, you know what? If you want to take this one, I'll give you the victory lap on that. But then it's on to Broadwater Natatorium in Helena, Montana, which was established in 1889 by Charles Broadwater, who, much like Henry Plant, was in charge of a railroad. The rather massive structure would look out of place today if it was still standing, but back in the day, Helena was a pretty major gold rush town, and the Natatorium actually had water supplied to it by 1.5 miles of redwood piping that took water from springs up in the mountains down into the Natatorium which is, we used redwoods as pipes. Really? Yeah. I will be honest, I learned doing this research that we used to make pipes out of redwood. Now, while the construction of the building isn't particularly well documented, the architect is because he was the state architect for Montana and actually ended up getting involved in a scandal for accepting bribes. And while I could not find pictures of the building's construction, I was able to find pictures of Helena in 1870 and there is no natatorium there. And there's also zero evidence whatsoever that the photos were doctored. And if you're wondering why did Helena, Montana and a bunch of gold miners need a, you know, a giant natatorium, well, it's because during the gold rush, about 50 millionaires lived in Helena. That was the most millionaires living anywhere in the U.S. in one space. Now, of course, a million dollars was a lot more money back then, so it would be less impressive today, but... The building eventually changed hands, Charles Broadwater died, fell into a period of disuse, and then it got to the point where it was so decrepit that they could only really tear it down, and they did that back in 1974. And I feel like at this point I have made my point, but he does go on to show several more photos of buildings that do have backstories and evidence for their construction, just like all of these ones did. But he says that there's no proof that they were built in the fashion they tell us, other than state-approved documents, manipulated photos, and just complete lies. Now, he provides no evidence that any of these documents were at any point state-approved in some sort of legitimate process. We've actually caught him using manipulated photos and lowering the resolution of other photos to make them seem more mysterious, and he downright lied about the Tampa Bay Hotel having no pictures of its construction and about the quality of the pictures. So as far as old world architecture, 
Stolen Cities, all that goes. I think I, I think I have made my point that none of these are actually mysterious when you look into their backgrounds. Requires that you actually do look into their backgrounds though. So I guess what you could say is it's only really a mystery if either you don't do any research or if you're misleading people for the ad revenue. So let's move on to the next subject at hand because we just finished covering that one, which is buried cities. We're told of a common theme in downtown America of buildings with entire floors below street level. These have windows, doors, you know, it's these were clearly at street level at one point in history. So to support this, he shows us pictures of mud flooded windows and then as an example, gives us a picture of Kansas City that we debunked in the last video. Now, as far as the explanation for these entire stories that are below street level, which to be fair, in many cases actually were at street level at one point and became basements later, uh, he does claim that the mainstream narrative is that, oh, well, they're just basements. Of course, that's not true at all. In some cases, they are just basements. In other cases, we have records of the streets being raised. As I said, the hills had to be excavated as Kansas City expanded. The Seattle underground was created after a fire destroyed 66 blocks of the city, and they just took the opportunity to raise the grade of the streets because the area had a flooding problem anyway. I also need to point out that this has happened in cities all over Europe as well, so pointing to Tartaria for this doesn't make any sense. Where was Tartaria? And as far as getting stuff buried under the mud, like where'd all this mud come from? There are a couple of different answers if you ask the Tartaria community. The most typical one I've gotten, well, I, I shouldn't say most typical, but one of the ones I've gotten is that the Antiquitech, the technology of the Tartarians, got, it, it caused soil liquefaction and entire cities just kind of sank a couple meters. Mind Unveiled suggests mud volcanoes. Now, soil liquefaction of this scale would likely cause buildings to collapse, not just sink. It is possible that a building could remain intact, but these kinds of buildings, that, that scale of soil liquefaction, they're probably gonna fall over. And then as for Mind Unveiled's version, which is of course the mud volcanoes, that's not something that just disappears. We, we know where the mud volcanoes in the United States are. We have them tracked. We can pretty much debunk the whole mud flood thing, the whole, uh, at least the mud volcano thing, with the point that there is not one near Seattle at all, and none of the ones in the United States are remotely large enough to bury a city. You can actually see some in Yellowstone. One of his supporting arguments for this mud flood thing is St. Mary Magdalene Church in Omaha, Nebraska, which of course we discussed in the last video. We completely debunked this. Uh, they regraded the streets down considerably to flatten some hills so that they could expand the city westward. And the result was that St. Mary Magdalene Church, which was built on a hill, as they regraded, they had to build a new foundation for the church under it. So what he is claiming is the church being dug out of the mud, when you look at the pictures, is very clearly them digging out the hillside under the church and building the new foundation. He notes underground windows and doors that lead to nowhere, but in many cases, what he's showing are very legitimately just basements that have windows to let in light, because these were built before electric lighting in many cases. And then also, sometimes he does show them, but these ones are the result of street raising projects. And no, I'm not just gonna say, oh, these are just the result of street raising projects, we don't need to go any further into it, because when I said that in the last video and basically implied that you could find the evidence pretty easily yourself, a lot of his supporters and he himself said I provided no evidence. So now I'm gonna go point by point through the evidence of his examples and how we know that they were not created by mud flood volcanoes. I mean, first up, we've been talking about America this whole time, and the first image he shows naturally is of the Russian Polytechnic Institute in Moscow. Now what he's showing in that image is the restoration of that building. Back in the, the 2010s, the Russian government decided that it had kind of fallen into disrepair, and they wanted it to look nicer again. So they hired a British company called Event Communications, and uh, they got to work basically organizing how they were gonna make this building look nicer. It's a beautiful building, by the way. The building was opened in its first phase, which was originally just what is now the central portion of the building, and that was in 1872, and then two wings were added later as the museum expanded. I was able to determine that the image shown in the video is the northwest facade of the building, to be clear, and the photograph is from the 2010s, <laughs> But here's the thing about the Northwest facade and why it can't possibly be buried Tartarian architecture. It's because the Northwest facade was not built yet. The first photograph I could find, the earliest I could find of this building was from 1884 and neither of the wings are there yet. So they can't be digging Tartarian architecture out of the mud if the architecture wasn't there in the first place. 
He moves us on to the fact that many American towns and cities have underground cities which make no sense. He asks, and I quote, did they just do a bunch of extra work for nothing? Put windows and doors and streets down there for the heck of it? And uh, he asks this while an article explaining why this exists in Seattle is literally on screen. Now I would go into that article, but we also just explain Seattle. <laughs> He moves on to show us Chattanooga, where the streets were raised between 1875 and 1905 to handle flooding issues. The article he pulls up on screen, which implies that this is a complete mystery and nobody knows why these streets were raised, is from Atlas Obscura, which I will admit has some pretty well-written stuff, but it's not the most reliable source when it comes to you know, really doing research on this kind of thing. So while it's fair to say that evidence of the streets being raised is hard to come by, that's different from saying there's no evidence and no explanation for why the streets were raised. For example, the Memphis Daily Appeal on the 24th of March, 1867, notes extensive damage caused by flooding in Chattanooga and on March 15th, uh, the Louisville Daily Courier, sorry, Louisville Daily Courier says the same thing. And the latter article from the Louisville Daily Courier, that one mentions that the water level rose at least two stories. A March 4th, 1875 article in the Chattanooga Daily Times records a meeting to discuss a solution to the flooding. The article includes a suggestion that they raise the streets just like Chicago recently had, and that that was a more permanent, more long-term, and cheaper solution than a levy that would have to be replaced and repaired constantly. A letter to the editor in the same issue of that newspaper suggests taking dirt from Cameron Hill and using it to raise Market, Chestnut, and Railroad Avenues, as well as Poplar and Chestnut Streets. He argues that this would open Cameron Hill for development as well as solve the flooding issue and therefore would be a net positive. And yet another piece in that same issue of the Chattanooga Daily Times mentions that streets in Chattanooga have been raised before to deal with flooding without any issue. An article in that same paper dated July 7th, 1875, notes that Market Street's grade has not yet been adjusted. A November 18th article from the same year does note and does remind people that Mayor James is responsible for the unauthorized raising of the Market Street grade. Further articles go on to discuss raising more streets, including an April 19th, 1886 one, in which it was petitioned that the city raise all streets above the high water mark of 1875. So, clearly we have records of why the streets were raised, and it was not a mud flood, it was a river flood. He also shows Kansas City's underground as an example, but that's not even what he's suggesting it is, because it's, it's not, you know, underground streets. It was a, a converted mine and storage space that became commercial space. And I want to take us back to the question he asked, which was, did they just do a bunch of extra work for nothing? Put windows and doors and streets down there for the heck of it. This question is important because his claim that there were lower levels of the cities in America which have been built over is correct. His reasoning, however, is demonstrably incorrect. He also says that there are massive tunnel systems under most US major cities and that this alone should be reasoned question. He says this despite the fact that we do have evidence and explanations for many of these tunnel systems, including the ones he shows, and one of the pictures he uses in this whole thing is a stock photo of a mine shaft from a listicle. In fact, in this specific segment, the only example of a tunnel given is the mine shaft, which again, rural mine shaft, stock photo, listicle. Sewers come up next with Mind Unveiled claiming that we did not have proper waste management until the year 1900. Now, on screen it says the 19th century, so I don't know who messed up there. He claims that people were defecating in chamber pots into the 1850s and just throwing them out the window into the streets. Now, it is true that people were still using chamber pots in the 1850s, but it was very much illegal to throw your waste out the window. That doesn't mean people didn't do it. They did, but that wasn't the preferred method. It was also not the legal method for how to dispose of waste. Additionally, most homes being built in the 1800s had privies in them or even flushing toilets. For those that don't know what a privy is, it's basically a, a bathroom, but instead of a flushing toilet that goes into the sewage system, it's usually uh, drops into a sewer below that ends up getting flushed. And in other cases, particularly in rural areas, you might have an outhouse, which was kind of the same idea, a latrine, where you dug a hole in the ground, filled it up with, you know, ash, and that was your toilet. Or they might have a cesspit, which would be you use a chamber pot or something along those lines, and you throw it into a cesspit. And in rural areas, that was pretty common because human waste, much like animal waste, makes great fertilizer. I think a lot of people don't 
don't quite grasp that aspect of a lot of these things about history is that we we didn't used to have specialties for every single thing. You you made the most use out of everything that you possibly could. Many projects, many skills, many activities, things that people did for productive reasons often had dual purposes. Now, of course, as industrialized cities grew and it was harder and harder to stop people from doing things like throwing their waste into the streets, you started to see epidemics like cholera. But here's the thing about cholera, it wasn't necessarily people dumping waste out the window that caused the cholera epidemics. It was waste in cesspits and dung heaps seeping into the groundwater and into the drinking water of the cities of London and New York and Philadelphia, places that had huge populations, and the infrastructure wasn't really there for a population that large. So what you had was people didn't understand germ theory, they still thought that disease spread through odors, and you had dung, you had waste that seeped into the groundwater, it got into the wells, people drank from the wells, and then you got sick. It's important to mention here that cholera is actually what led to the development of modern sewer systems as well as germ theory, because it was realized that, hey, human waste ain't exactly good for you, and also there's tiny animals in it and they want to kill you. They actually don't want to kill you, it's, it's, it's not on purpose most of the time. Viruses, though. He goes on to say, what you have is this complete contradiction with the cultures, technology, and population counts needed to create these cities and buildings on this magnitude and scale in such a short time frame. He says, they were building structures in just a few years that were taking hundreds of years in Europe. Now, he does not give examples of the buildings that were taking hundreds of years in Europe, but I can only imagine he's talking about cathedrals. I, th there's basically nothing else that ever took hundreds of years to build in Europe. Castles might take a couple decades, but... Now the thing is, cathedral building tapered off in the 1500s as it just became less popular, and also uh, the first American building he shows as an example is the Philadelphia City Hall. I should probably point out that City Hall broke ground in 1871 and was completed in 1901. That is 30 years, that is multiple decades, that is not a few years compared to a cathedral taking several hundred. Additionally, there are photos of the construction of Philadelphia City Hall, like a number of them including pictures that show the ground before it was there as the site of City Hall, and then also pictures of people building City Hall. Also, City Hall is uh, Second Empire-style architecture, which is not, not Russian or Moorish, even in the slightest. Additionally, in Mind Unveiled's chronology, the Middle Ages did not happen. So basically, 400 to 1400 didn't happen, right? The Notre Dame was completed in the 1300s, which means that there is, even in his chronology, that means that the latest it could have actually been built was 1400. There's still about 500 years between these two buildings being completed. It's not the same technology, it's not the same materials, it's not the same culture, it's not the same time frame. And I should also probably bring up that if the Middle Ages didn't happen, how do we know it took hundreds of years to build the cathedrals? that were built in the Middle Ages, if all of that's faked. The next example he gives is St. Thomas Catholic Church in Manhattan, and this is the third St. Thomas Church to bear that name and serve that congregation. There's actually another one now, because this one burned down. It was constructed from 1865 to 1870, and it's not cathedral-sized, or at least it, it wasn't. So first of all, I want to point out, in terms of the, the culture and technology point, the first skyscraper was built in Chicago just 15 years later. And yes, there's photos of that skyscraper being built. Now, there are no readily available construction photos of St. Thomas Church. But like I said, the church burned down in 1905, and most likely any records they had, any pictures of it being built, would have been stored there. So, any records were probably just destroyed. There are, however, paintings of the first St. Thomas Church, which was built in the 1700s, and it looks different. But no, I wasn't gonna stop there and just give you the logical explanation. No, I have to go deeper, because I know he will take this out of context if he can. I have to point out to you that there are mentions of this building being built in the newspaper during the time it's being built. The August 2nd, 1865 issue of the Brooklyn Union reported on the sale of the old property and the likely neighborhood location of the new one. The New York Times issue of the same day corroborates this, adding that a new site had not been selected yet. An article in the New York Daily Herald, this one from the April 21st, 1867 issue, notes a service at the temporary chapel of St. Thomas Church located at 53rd and 5th. If there was already a church standing there, why did they need a temporary chapel? An article from the New York Times in 1870 notes that the interior of St. Thomas Church had been completed. If it were already there, 
why is there a New York Times article saying the interior had just been completed in 1870? And also, it's just abundantly clear that no research has been done by Mind Unveiled into the different architectural styles of American construction. Like, there have been numerous well-documented Old World Revival styles, including Gothic, Moorish, Romanesque, all of those. But he comes back to remind us of the topic at hand, right? Which is, many of the downtowns in America have Old World buildings that do not have an in-depth historical record. We've just gone example by example to show you that he cannot back this claim and that there is significant evidence against it. Many of the examples he gave were in conflicting styles, most had evidence that they were in fact constructed when and how they claimed, and he used a doctored photo of the Washington Street Tunnel to prove his point. He also, on numerous occasions throughout this segment, asked why buildings that were constructed before photography existed have no photographic evidence of their construction. For example, he shows the old medical college in Augusta, Georgia, built four years before photography made it to the United States. Also, it's neoclassical, and again, he has pegged, it's actually Greek Revival, but similar styles. Um, he has pegged Tartarian architecture as being Moorish and Russian inspired. So, but there's more because in the February 13th, 1834 issue of the Georgia Journal and Messenger, Georgia Journal and Messenger, it's reported that the Board of Trustees for the Medical College of the State of Georgia are planning a new building. And that's when the building was built, 1835. He also says that these buildings are very out of place for the time period, which we've pretty well demonstrated is just not true. And then he also says that in order to truly convince us, he'd have to just list them one by one, which we just did. He also says that it's weird that there's little consistency between textbooks from the 1950s and textbooks today. He doesn't give examples of that. But the textbooks are being written by the historians. Like, professional historians are the people who write history textbooks, at least at the college level. And as we do more and more historical research and more and more of the past comes to light, the textbooks change to reflect that new knowledge. And in fact, if the textbooks from the 1950s and the textbooks from today were the same, and that meant we had learned nothing new, that would actually be more evidence for a cover-up, in my opinion, because there's no way we didn't learn anything new in 73 years. He also asks, why is it so crazy to question that the buildings that were being built all across America, even the ones from the early 1900s, in some cases? It's kind of a weird phrasing, but it is a question. Like, I just feel like he left out a word. And it's not crazy. What's crazy is questioning it, doing no research, and then insisting that nobody can explain what happened despite mountains of evidence. Also, just really quickly, because I probably should get this out of the way, because it came up in his response video to me, but um, I have had more fun doing this video and the last Tartaria video than I have had recently for any of our content. I love history, and this has just been an excuse for me to bury my nose into historical documents for two weeks. I'm having a great time. He also says, one of the things that Charlie demanded was evidence. Well, I agree. Where is the evidence that they built these old world buildings? Well, photos, newspapers, private correspondence, building records, probably a ton of government records that we just you know, are, are hidden away in some library or some basement somewhere. I mean, think about it. Most, if not all, of these buildings required permits. Those permits are probably in the archives somewhere. And I know that you can say that this stuff's all fake, that it's all doctored, whatever. There's no evidence of that. You've provided none. But of course, in the video, he claims that the photos could just be doctored. But the reasoning for the doctored photos comes primarily from his opinion on Civil War photography and early war photography in general. Now, today, a lot of the pictures you get from the war front are just pictures of the war front. But at a time when camera technology really wasn't that great, again, 1865, if people were moving around on a battlefield, all that photo was gonna show was a bunch of blurry people and some smoke. So in order to make pictures of war, look like war, they did often have to stage things. Now, that wasn't lying, it was kind of like painting the battle, kind of recreating it. You took a picture of the landscape, you took a picture of soldiers standing in formation, you maybe edited in photos from another picture, and you created what was, to your the best of your ability, an accurate depiction of the battle that happened there. You don't really need to do that with construction photos because there's not much smoke and gunfire going on and the building isn't charging as the bugle plays. Now listen, I'm, I'm not gonna for a second argue against doctored war photos from the 1800s and early 1900s because well documented, we know about it. I just, I gotta point out that you cannot claim all the photos are doctored just because the war photos are. It makes no sense. And it also does not explain why newspapers, back in the day, contemporary to these construction projects, have articles about the construction projects. And I must again point out the irony that he himself used several doctored photos in his video. And not, not calling out historians for doctoring them. He showed them to support his points. 
he wasn't showing a, a picture of, you know, and showing how historians doctored it. He goes through and he shows a doctored picture and says, hey, look, there's this weird thing in the sky. Like at one point, I think we covered this in the previous video, he shows pictures of blimps carrying away an obelisk and the Arc de Triomphe. And the blimps are the same blimp. It's like taking Getty Images stock photography in Canva and making something. Like they're very, these are some of the most obviously doctored photos I've ever seen. And he thinks those are real, but the very obviously not doctored photos of like Helena Montana in 1870, that they would have no reason to doctor again, those are doctored. And we kind of move into maps for a second here because he says that he's doubtful that the photos of construction are real, just as Charlie was doubtful that early maps of America depict castles. And that is because they don't depict castles, they depict settlements. When the Europeans got there and they were asking about settlements in the interior, not the ones that they were seeing on the coasts, they had to just have them described to them because they hadn't been there. And between the language barrier and the fact that they were very much used to walled settlements back home, stone walled cities, a lot of the time map makers just thought that these cities had stone walls. I mean, if, if you look at the depictions on these maps, they are very clearly generic walled settlements. They are not, they do not look like any of these cities. It's like somebody grabbed a, a stock castle icon and put it into Canva and put it on a map. And on top of that, many of these early maps were drawn by artists who hadn't even been on the expeditions. And when they were drawn by artists who had been on the expeditions, those expeditions were pretty much purely coastal. So anything you're seeing on the interior of one of these maps, nobody who drew the map, if you're talking about like the 1500s, nobody had seen that stuff. A lot of the time they were actually relying on the description of the Native Americans given to an explorer who then got back to Portugal and gave somebody a, a description and said, here, draw a map. And no, I'm not saying that's how all of them were done, but you need to understand the process here. And while he's saying all of this, there is a map up on screen that shows Spanish and French claims in North America, as well as the locations of Spanish French colonies and also Native American settlements, which brings up yet another question, which is who are the Native Americans, mind unveiled? Who are the Native Americans? That is a legitimate question I have. I should also point out that the Antonio Pereira map that this is all coming from was made in 1546, and there absolutely should be Spanish and French claims on the American coastlines and even partially into the interior. Doesn't mean that they went there, it just means they claimed it. Does not mean the guy who made the map went there. So no, the map is not depicting castles, it's just poor information. And from what I could tell, it's possible that Antonio Pereira actually did travel to South America and may have been on Francisco de Oriana's uh, expedition to explore the Amazon, but I found no evidence that he had ever been to North America. And I mean that like he himself had never been to North America as far as I can tell, which means anything he was drawing of North America was in fact based on another map or the word of somebody else. And then we move on to him claiming another photo is doctored or fake, and that is the uh, lunch atop a skyscraper photo. And on screen, he has the word fake, and also uh, the headline of a Washington Post article that is saying that that picture isn't what you think it is, that it's not what it seems. Now, he takes this to mean that the workers were never 70 stories up building 30 Rockefeller Plaza, and it's a composite of several images, but of course that is not what the article is saying. First of all, that building was built in 1932. There are people alive today who remember a time before it was there. They'd be very old, but they'd remember. But the thing is, those are real iron workers. They are sitting 70 stories up. They are all on an I-beam and they are eating lunch. The part that is not what it seems about the photo is this is not a candid. It wasn't a photographer up there who just casually snapped a picture. Again, 1932, just that makes no sense logically that there would be a photographer just hanging out up there. So no wonder it's staged. What was actually happening was that they were setting up for that building a marketing campaign because it was gonna be opened and a whole bunch of space was gonna be sold and leased inside of it. So to get everybody hyped about the new building, they took a bunch of different photos, including this one, and those kind of went out into the newspapers. And since his source for this claim seems to be that Washington Post article, I'm just gonna use his source because it disagrees with him. He, he did not understand what he was reading or he didn't read it. He shows us the cover art for the American magazine in the July 1774 issue. Sorry, is it, sorry, the January 1774 issue. And on that, he points out that, you know, it's depicting this huge city in the background, right? And also there's, there's natives in the foreground. Well, that magazine was published in Boston and it depicts 
Boston. He's saying that this is, you know, a depiction of some massive city, but when you actually do look at it, it seems about right for Boston's population of about 16,000 plus whoever was itinerant there. So merchants, traders, soldiers, people just passing through. You, you probably had 20 to 25,000 people in Boston at any given time alongside 16,000 permanent residents. And on top of all of that, it's not a photo, it's just an artist's rendition. So using this to suggest that it's a faithful representation of Boston and that this is somehow evidence that Boston was built by the Tartarians makes no sense at all. And then he talks about the seven cities of Cibola, which are on a map attributed to uh, Joan Martinez in 1578. Now, Joan Martinez was a Sicilian map maker who eventually moved to work for the court of either the King of Portugal or Spain. It's escaping me right now. Now, here's what's interesting. There's a 1578 map, and there's a 1587 map. In the 1578 map, the seven cities of Cibola are shown as being north of the Tropic of Cancer and just east of Baja, you know, the, the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. In the 1587 map, uh, the Baja Peninsula looks a lot more like the actual Baja Peninsula and less like what somebody said it looked like. And there's no seven cities of Cibola just nine years later. So when did the cover-up happen? because that would imply that they were covering up the Tartarian architecture as far back as 1587. Did they find it and take it off so nobody else would find it? Did they explore and not find it? It, it just doesn't make any real sense, and also if, if it was real and they did find it, I'm pretty sure it would be visible on Google Images today, unless they found it and covered it up, but he provided no evidence that it ever was found and covered up. And to say that, hey, the natives said this thing was here and we didn't find it, therefore, uh, that's doctored history. I, I just, it's not. The math ain't mathin'. And additionally, I'll admit I didn't actually look into the possibility of this, but it did occur to me that logically, it could make sense that the Aztecs, who were being terrorized by the Spanish, might suggest to the Spanish that there were a bunch of much wealthier and larger cities to the north that they should go check out. And furthermore, as far as I can tell, Jean Martinez never actually went to America, so that needs to be considered when looking at his maps and considering how accurate they may be. So it doesn't really matter that he depicted the seven cities of Cibola as being stonewalled with towers because he himself never saw them, nor did anyone else in recorded history. Like, we're talking about El Dorado. And he also says that he trusts these ancient manuscripts more than photography, which is something I simply cannot address kindly. But since we're talking about trust, I think we should hit pause and talk a moment about the people he does trust. He consistently cites a Connor McDarry, whose real name was John A. Guerin, and he was born in 1860 and died in 1947. Since Mind Unveiled cites McDarry religiously, I picked up a copy of the book. This was originally published in 1923. And McDarry claims that the Irish were masters of the whole earth. So we're taking this a little farther than Mind Unveiled did claiming explicitly that their empire was worldwide. And it should be said, then, that McDarry's sources, by necessity, are older than his book. His sources on Egypt, which is an important part of his thesis, are as follows in the order of their citation. He cites Donnelly in 1882, Tyler, misspelled as Taylor in McDarry's book, in 1881, and Osborne, no further citation given, who is present in Donnelly and therefore pre-1882, Rawlinson in 1877, and Goodrich in 1838. Worse still, the passage where he cites all of those people is basically just plagiarized out of Atlantis, the antediluvian world, by Ignatius Donnelly. And Donnelly was writing long before Egypt was properly understood or excavated by actual archaeologists. But we'll come back to Donnelly. But I would argue that McDerry's most important contribution to Mind Unveiled's theory is a glossary of Irish and Hebrew words that look, sound, and mean the same things. That glossary is right here, right on this page. Now what's interesting about this glossary is that it's almost completely fake. He cites J.M. Price, who was a theosophist writer active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, who wrote in 1910 that Hebrew was originally the priestly language of Egypt. While there are definitely loan words between Hebrew and Egyptian, they are not dialects of the same language. Now, of course, the prize citation is just for the one bit about Hebrew and Irish and that being the original dialect, but we're mostly working off of Donnelly here because McDerry is citing Donnelly anyway. It's important to, to mention that Donnelly was writing in 1882 and the Mernepta Stella, which bears the inscription, Israel is laid waste, its seed is no more, 
was discovered in 1896 and dates to around 1200 BC. Now, in my opinion, the Exodus probably occurred as a historical event between 1207 and 1206 BC from the winter to the spring, and this is because many of the events described in Exodus fit that timeline. Historical events, astronomical events, architectural advances, things like that. I won't go into the details here, but, you know, that makes sense for the Exodus. Now, why would Merneptah say something along the lines of, we've completely wiped out the Israelites? Couple of possibilities. A, either he saw them go off into the wilderness and just assumed they all died out there, or he didn't want to record a defeat, which is very common of ancient rulers. Caesar was prolific about this. He never, he did not report defeats. It was actually part of the reason that he was able to keep going in Gaul is because nobody ever knew he was losing until, you know, much later. But the Merneptah Stella, which was again 1896, but dates to 1200 or so BC, combined with the 2022 discovery of a small lead tablet found on Mount Ebal in Israel, which bears the inscription of a curse with the word Yahweh in ancient Hebrew, in like basically proto-Hebrew, when you combine those two, it really, really, really just obliterates the timeline here. How could the Catholics have doctored Hebrew scripture in Israel literally 2,000 years before they moved the Jews to Israel from Ireland? Like, it, how does that line up? It proves that the Jews were writing about, the, the, the Hebrew people, the, the people of the Levant, were writing about Yahweh long before the Catholics existed, let alone were writing about him. But that's really only disproving the timeline. What about the vocab? McDari and his sources as well were writing during a time when the modern field of linguistics was just starting to come about. People in the 1800s were only just starting to ask the question, hey, did all of our languages in Europe descend from the same one? At the time, some people believed that European or Aryan languages, as they were called at the time, developed in the, the, the East, in Persia, that area, with Sanskrit being the oldest. But that didn't quite make sense, so some people looked west and said, well, what if it originated in the west and moved east? But others looked north. They thought, what if it didn't come from the west or the east? What if it spread from somewhere else? And what they found is that that's what happened. Basically, a group called the Yamnaya culture today were the original Indo-European speakers. They were the people who brought the European language to Europe as well as the Middle East. That's why Iranian and some Northern Indian languages are actually more similar to English and German than they are to Semitic and Eastern languages. And since Sanskrit and Irish both derive from Proto-Indo-European, it makes sense that one is not derived from the other. McDari also claims that the entire captivity of the Jews in Egypt was a myth, which I, I will be honest, is an actual scholarly theory. There are some people who believe that. There is another camp who disagrees. But between the Stella, which says Israel is laid waste right when the Exodus would have been, and the tablet being where it should be for 1200 or so BC after the Exodus with the word Yahweh on it, strong evidence to the contrary and that, that McDari is just wrong here. He also goes on to claim that the Irish word for Jews derives from the Irish word Yud, which would mean day or light, according to McDari. But the closest I could find was Yud spelled differently, which uh, is a pronoun meaning that and does not mean Jews. And this isn't the only time, because he provides a list of jargonized Irish and Hebrew words that he claims bear similarity. For example, Ab is given as father in both, but it actually means abbot in Irish and father in Hebrew. Abel and Abad, and if I am Butchering these pronunciations, I apologize, but I don't think these are real words half the time anyway from what I can tell, so... And I'm not saying all of the words are fake words, I'm just saying that a lot of these words are not what they are supposed to be. But a bale and a bod are both given as death, however, neither word means death. In fact, neither word even seems to exist in its given spelling, though avad does apparently mean father in Hebrew. Then he gives ba as meaning cows in Irish, and he gives no Hebrew counterpart. Additionally, ba does not mean cow in Irish. There is a bow that means cow in Irish, though. Bahain and abad are both also given as to die. Uh, the Hebrew is spelled wrong, as I mentioned, and the Irish word doesn't exist or doesn't mean death. If it does, I checked. He's also unclear about whether he's comparing Old Irish and Biblical Hebrew or Old Irish and Modern Hebrew or Modern Irish and Old Hebrew. Like, it, it, there's not a lot of clarity for what's going on here. Also, jargonized does not mean what he used it for. I'm still not entirely sure what he meant by jargonized. I think he means, like, anglicized the spelling. Additional point here. There is no evidence that John Guerin, Connor McDarry, ever went to Ireland or spoke Irish. 
Basta is given as shower alongside the Hebrew bastek, but neither word means shower. The former in an Irish dictionary gave me uh, baptism in the modern Irish and did not return any word for the old Irish. Ban and bahin are both given for Hebrew, but I couldn't find the word bahin in any Hebrew dictionary. Ban does mean woman though, and there is a different Hebrew word for woman that sounds nothing like bahin. Dub is given with dob as great, prodigious, black, or burned. Great and burned are not synonyms, nor is prodigious a synonym of burned, but dub can mean black. But I also did look up the, the Hebrew for, I looked up the English to Hebrew, and not a single one of those words returned dob as a translation. Uh, ice and aish are both given as man, but ice means to exist in modern Irish and to track in old Irish, whereas fair means man now. The Hebrew spelling is way off for that to mean what he's saying it means, but the sound is close enough, I guess. And the thing is, the rest of the list continues in this manner. It's completely made up. Also, I haven't read the entire book, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't actually say what Irish dictionary he used for this, or what Hebrew dictionary he used. He just kind of cites other people. Yeah, I'm looking through it right now, live on camera. Aiden can, can see that happening, and uh, I, I don't see any... Yeah, he doesn't cite what dictionaries he's using. That's hilarious. Also, he says, and, and I quote, every Celtic scholar, investigator, and thinker will at once comprehend the incontrovertible nature of the proof here submitted in this list of Irish words with their Hebrew derivatives as to who the Jews and Hebrews were. British and Roman lies cannot prevail against it. Um, hey guys, I concentrated on Celtic studies. He's wrong. <laughs> like, I see no, no link between Hebrew and Irish aside from the possibility of a few loan words. I want to point out, by the way, that, that that was him saying Celtic scholars will agree. No, they don't. Now, as for Donnelly, a little bit less crazy, but more because he had less access to information than McDarry. So McDarry just comes across as insane. Donnelly comes across as uninformed to the modern sensibilities. Early in his book on Atlantis, Donnelly claimed that Egypt had no archaic period and that their architecture simply showed up as is. No prior evolution of style or technique, just we, we found these incredible pyramids and these temples, and clearly there, there's no evidence of any period of like a Bronze Age or a Copper Age or a Neolithic, yet yeah, it actually says, one of the people he cites, says that there is no evidence of a Neolithic Egypt. It's not true, at least not now. But you can't quite fault Donnelly for it because Egypt was still not totally understood. In fact, he was writing before the full excavation of most of the pyramids, including the smaller step pyramids that definitely predate the Great Pyramids. Since we have now step pyramids as well as the Great Pyramids, it's clear that those are not the same style. One is older than the other, and all evidence points to the step pyramids being the older ones. What's more, as far as I can tell, Donnelly never went to Egypt or Ireland. He was writing entirely based on the works of others that he had read. And all of this was done before any of the major excavations you hear about, like King Tut. And even just taking the pyramids entirely out of it, if we just look at things that are definitively tombs and nothing else, and no, I'm not saying the pyramids are like an electricity station or some kind of thing, I'm just saying that I don't want to get into that right now. So if we just look at tombs, there is a very clear evolution of pre-pyramid tombs to temple tombs to pyramid tombs, and then actually back to temple tombs. So here's the kicker. Everything Donnelly knew about Egypt in 1881 to 82 when he was writing his book was lacking the understanding that we had yet to find a bunch of older Egyptian stuff. The pre-pyramid tombs were discovered in 1902. King Tut, I think, was 1915. And there are more issues with Donnelly, but the simple lack of information available to him in 1882 is really enough to make the point. And also, I'm, I'm not an Egyptologist, a Celtic scholar medieval studies scholar. Another very commonly cited source here is Michael Tsarian, who is uh, a writer. I wasn't really sure how to describe him. <laughs> now, Tsarian, of course, goes on to cite McDarry, who cites Donnelly, and Tsarian also cites Donnelly. The problem here is that everything kind of goes back to Donnelly, and Donnelly's work, again, was way, 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 way before a ton of modern stuff that really did clear all of this up with substantiated evidence. 
But Sarian displays a stunning lack of understanding of Christian theology at one point in his book, and I thought it was worth mentioning. Because I was going through and I was just looking around for stuff that I was like, alright, what can I... What has he mentioned in the video that Sarian might have said, right? Well, Sarian refers to the donation of Constantine as the scandalous forgery upon which Christianity was created, but seems to not understand what it was, because it wasn't that. The donation, also known as the Donatio, was a forged document that was most likely created in the late 700s or mid 700s. It was it's believed that it was meant to uh, basically convince Pepin the Short or Charlemagne to give back lands the Pope had given to the Franks, because according to the donation of Constantine, Constantine, back in, you know, like 325 or something, wrote a document in which he gave away the entire western half of the Roman Empire to the Catholic Church, to the Pope. Now, of course, this never happened. And even in the 1400s, people were able to realize and prove that this was a forgery. But from the 8th century even into the 15th century, the donation of Constantine was still being trotted out by the Vatican. And the idea here was that Constantine had given control of the western half of the Roman Empire over to, I think it was Pope Sylvester I. But Sylvester I, or whichever pope it actually was, he kindly just gave it all back. He was like, no, 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 you're, you're better equipped to handle this. But that he never formally ceded the land back. So what that means is that the Catholic Church actually is the chief authority in Western Europe, even over all secular rulers. Now, like I said, it is a known forgery. But it was not a theological forgery. The entire point of the document was that the Pope has authority over secular authorities. So its theological impact was pretty minimal, but what it did do was give specifically the Catholic Church, and keep in mind, not the Eastern Church. The Roman Catholic, the Bishop of Rome was the only person who was benefiting from this document. It was used for this purpose numerous times, including once by Pope Leo IX when he was asserting his supremacy over Michael I, the Patriarch of Byzantine Christianity, of, uh, of Constantinople. And according to Joseph Wisniewski at Virginia Polytechnic, the document was used by at least ten popes. Its use against Michael I is part of what led to the Great Schism of 1054, and it was used again when writing the Dictatus Pape and, you know, giving the, the reasoning for this document's existence under Pope Gregory VII. This, of course, was during the Investor Controversy, where he was in a bit of a kerfuffle with Henry V of the Holy Roman Empire. But I just, I felt like we needed to address the, the three authors he cites most often because, again, both uh, Sarian is building off of McDarry, who's building off of Donnelly, who was fundamentally incorrect due to a lack of information available to him at the time. McDarry and Sarian have absolutely no excuse. But let's get back to the, you know, the fourth person in this line, which is Mind Unveiled. And immediately after saying that he trusts maps drawn by people who never saw the locations they were describing more than he trusts photography, he shows us a photograph of the laying of the capstone of the Salt Lake City Mormon Temple. There is an Eye of Providence in this photo, and clearly the implication, because he zooms in on it, is that the Freemasons staged the photo. In reality, Masonic capstone laying ceremonies are very much a thing, and Joseph Smith was a Freemason and brought a ton of Masonic stuff into Mormonism, including Masonic symbols, Masonic rituals, Masonic hierarchies. He basically took a bunch of Mason stuff and worked it into Mormonism. So, A, Joseph Smith was a Freemason, it makes sense that there was Masonic symbolism involved, and B, why would the Freemasons leave evidence that they forged it? By the way, there's absolutely no reason to think that this photo is staged or doctored. There, there's literally no reason. But I'm going to keep going because he does too, because he shows us an image of Mormon miners at a quarry cutting stone for that specific temple, and he claims that it's fake. He actually shows two different images, but talks about them as if they're the same one, which I'm not sure if that's just because he doesn't realize he's using two different pictures, or if he's genuinely trying to deceive people. Once again, I, I really can't tell. And considering this is still within the vein of the, well, it only took them a few years to build these massive structures when in Europe it took hundreds, it took 40 years to complete the Salt Lake City Mormon Temple. It, it was not a short process, and that was with considerable advancements in construction technology between the building of cathedrals and then. Also, cathedrals were considerably more ornate than the Mormon Temple is. 
In the first photo, he claims that the sky was removed from it because it appears to just be kind of a white background, and also that a man has his legs through a piece of stone, and therefore the left side of the photo was added in later, was edited in. First of all, it is a photo taken in 1872, so the sky probably wasn't going to be all that detailed anyway. As for the man, he's just leaning against a stone block at an angle, and because soft tissue is soft, it kind of molds itself to stone. It's very obvious that he's just leaning against a block. His legs are not through. It's taken at an angle where you can see, like, the angle is what's causing it to look like his legs are going through the stone. He then proceeds to show a manipulated version of the same exact image, claiming that the vanilla skies are the key to knowing that this is a photoshopped image. And once again, his vanilla skies thing from the, the photoshopped one that he showed. He then shows a second photo from the same angle, but clearly taken several minutes or even possibly hours later, but most likely several minutes later. And he says that the sky has been removed and that uh, there is a floating ladder. Oh, and of course there are no faces on any of the people in the photograph. So again, old photo taken outdoors in the hot sun, everyone's wearing a hat, of course there's shadows over their faces. And on top of that, one guy's face is visible, and also another guy's silo features are visible in silhouette. I also must ask the question, why would they remove their faces while doctoring the, video, the photo? Like, would, would they not take people with faces and put them in? The floating ladder is clearly just leaning against a rock at an angle, and its shadow is there too, so did they edit in the shadow as well? And I will say that the second photo, which is a, a stereographic image, so it's meant to be viewed through a, like, viewfinder thing that makes things look kind of 3D. It's just, you know, old, old school 3D. But the sky in the background, I'm thinking based on video, or not videos, pictures that I saw of that quarry today, that that's not the sky. I'm pretty sure that's, like, the quarry wall. Furthermore, if you look at the stereoscopic one he shows, that the way those work is that they are supposed to be two identical copies of an image, right? And that they are supposed to appear to be in 3D. So, if they're doctored, they should be identical. But if you look at what he claims is the removed sky, it's not identical, which suggests that either this was errors made during copying, that it's the age of the photo and things just started to look weird, maybe even that it was the scan of the photo that made it look that way, but this, this clearly is not photo manipulation. This is just low quality photography. He also doesn't seem to grasp that a lot of early photographs were touched up by artists when people appeared blurry or when not enough people actually showed up in frame because it was a cityscape, which meant a long exposure. So there's a lot of other possibilities here as to why the pictures don't look the way he expects them to, and most of them are related to his lack of understanding of early photography. Although at one point he actually does mention the exposure times, but doesn't address it. He claims that that's a whole nother video. So maybe he does understand it, or maybe he thinks he understands it. I really don't know. But what I do know is that there is no... The things he points out about this photo are completely explicable by technology. He goes on to say, The Mormons are said to have created multiple massive temple churches with no modern technology, and yet they're photo-manipulating photos? He says that, but then doesn't really elaborate. I don't understand what, what the, the comparison is here. There's no logical connection here. Also, he didn't prove they were manipulating photos. He pointed out some completely reasonable, low-quality photo artifacts, basically. He also does mention that the Book of Mormon says that there were people here with advanced cities long before the Europeans got here. And I'll give him credit, he does say that we probably shouldn't take the Book of Mormon literally, but he thinks it's an odd coincidence that the Mormons mentioned it. Like, why mention it? You know, unless they thought it was true, unless they had reason to believe it. Of course, there are significant differences between the Mormon description of the Lamanites and Tartaria. But he also neglected to mention that when the Mormons got to what is now Utah and Colorado, they thought that the Ute Native American peoples were the Lamanites. And then he reiterates his question from earlier, asking, how can we trust the history of these old world buildings when our historical record on many of these buildings is scarce? But as we've shown, it's not scarce. He just didn't look for it. And when there is evidence presented to him, he just claims it's fake. And then we're on to great fires. And he, he goes back to the Mormon connection here for a second. And I want to point out why that is ridiculous. 
it's because he uses a quote about the Lamanites from the Book of Mormon to talk about cities burning down. But what he doesn't seem to catch or understand is that the Mormons thought the Lamanites were Jewish. Because the Lamanites are descendants of Jewish people from Israel who came over here around 600 BC after the Neo-Assyrians took over the area. Yes, that is correct. We are talking about some of the lost 10 tribes of Israel. So that is a long time before his alleged hijack of the real Irish story and how it was shifted over onto Aramaic-speaking Syrians. By the way, Aramaic and Hebrew are very, very closely related in a way that is undeniable compared to when you try to connect Hebrew to Irish. So it makes no sense that there were already people speaking Aramaic in the Middle East and Hebrew was an Irish language. No sense made. Although he does suggest that, uh, I, gu I guess there's the, the linguistic issue of if you're claiming that Irish was the first language and that it expanded eastward, then you could theoretically have a derivative language in the Middle East by then. But also there's no archeological evidence of the Irish until 600 BC being in Ireland. But I, I must point out that Jews in 600 BC definitely, absolutely cannot conform to the narrative of Tartaria presented by Mind Unveiled. He definitively says there were not Jews in 600 BC, that it was still the Irish. But moreover, the passage is about events from over two millennia ago, but he's using it as evidence that the great fires of the 19th century all over America were deliberate. So he's using a description of events that allegedly, according to Joseph Smith, occurred in 600 BC or so to support the narrative that the great fires of the 19th century were deliberate. So what was the motive for these great fires, for actually pur like purposefully setting them? Well, clearly it was to get rid of all the Tartarian architecture, all the evidence that they had ever been there, except for all of the massive buildings that we supposedly didn't destroy, like the ones from Chicago and Tampa and Philadelphia and New York that he claims were all Tartarian that I guess just nobody thought to destroy around this time. Also, we're talking about fires that occurred over the course of a century. It's not like there was a spate of a whole bunch of fires in one year or one decade, and then we were able to just pretend this never happened. This was a, a court a century long. No, it couldn't possibly be that most buildings in American cities at the time were constructed with wooden frames. It also can't be the introduction of kerosene lighting. But just to, to go through it to show you how these this makes no sense at all, Chicago in 1871 was started when a cow kicked over a lantern. At least that's how the story goes. Now, in a barn, kicks over a lantern, lantern lights stuff on fire, the barn is made of wood, the barn catches on fire, wind carries the burning embers across to other buildings that are also wood framed or even made of wood. And then by the time the, all the fire needs to do is get into one building that's actually like a bigger building, like one of the blocks. And at that point, it's gonna spread through the foundation, it's gonna spread through the frames, it's gonna become an inferno, it's gonna spread even further as fire moves onto roofs. I, I mean, there's no reason to, there's no good reason to doubt that a cow knocking over a lantern in a barn could cause a fire. San Francisco in 1851 probably was arson and it started in a shop containing paint and upholstery, which are two very flammable things. Boston in 1872 started in the basement of a warehouse that was holding dry goods and thousands of people witnessed the attempts to fight it. Additionally, it destroyed the financial district. Pittsburgh in 1845 was started when somebody tried to heat some water with a fire and it was a drought and the wind carried the burning embers and they hit other flammable dry stuff and boom, fire. Galveston in 1875 was a foundry explosion. Newburyport in 1811 was arson. Portland in 1866 appears to have been firecrackers, which would make sense since the fire started on Independence Day. And on top of all of this, we have pictures of the burned out, very much not old world style brick buildings that were most of the victims of these fires. And the fires didn't burn down the entire cities for the most part. In most of these cases, large portions of the city were still standing and only a bit of it actually burned down. Caused a lot of damage, but it typically didn't burn down the entire city. And it also must be mentioned, if you are trying to destroy the records of a civilization, the architecture of a civilization that built in stone, why would you use fire? And no, this isn't just, you know, made up stuff later that somebody came up with in the 20th century. Newspaper reports from the time absolutely confirm that this is what people believe started these fires when the fires happened. He also claims that they were building things to be fireproof back then, and they just, they just weren't. 
like fire resistant, yes, there's a reason we use brick. It's because as long as the fire doesn't get into the, the foundation, into the frame, a brick house is gonna do pretty well. Significantly better than a wooden house. But also, like I said, we have pictures of the cities after these fires and we have the burned out brick buildings. He doesn't say the Tartarian's built in brick. He, he, most of the buildings he claims are Tartarian are masonry. So not brick, stone. And I'm not saying masonry as in Freemasonry. I'm saying masonry as in like masons, like stone masons built it. But Mind Unveiled simply dismisses all evidence of what might've started these fires while providing no evidence to the contrary. He just says, it's weird that all of these fires happened. It's really not. I mean, his argument is, is pretty well described as being, if the brick buildings were built to be fireproof, how could a cow knocking over a lantern cause 220 million in damages? Wooden frames. Wooden frames and floors burn away, everything collapses. Having convinced himself that the fires were deliberate, he then asks, why would we build all of this just to burn it down? Well, obviously we wouldn't, so they must have been burning down Tartarian stuff, right? Problem with this is, he still never showed any evidence that this was a deliberate, organized effort to burn down old cities, and also, like I said, brick buildings that were clearly new builds, and also we have all of this huge Tartarian architecture, and most of the cities survived for the most part. So, it doesn't even make sense. If that's what they were trying to do, they did a pretty bad job of it. And he also uses Sherman's March to the Sea as one of the examples, when scorched earth tactics in warfare, very, very common, very well known. And then, and then we move along to the next uh, subject here, which is secret societies. And I, I mean, you ever have somebody explain something to you that you're an expert in, in the most arrogant and incorrect way possible? Same. The very first thing he does in this section is show an image drawn and printed by Leo Taxil. Seems to be depicting Scottish Rite Masons at some form of ball, and for some reason in the background over what appears to be some sort of, like, just a uh, tent for some reason, he has the words Tartarian tent question mark. It, it doesn't really look like the actual tents of actual Tatar peoples, so I'm not sure why that was used. But also, if you're familiar with the anti-Masonic movement and all of that, you probably know the word or the name Leo Taxel, and we'll get to him in a second. The next image he shows is a French work, which in English is titled, The Mirror of the Past to Safeguard the Future. And on screen, he's written, okay, then you explain what's going on here. Well, the gist is that it's French revolutionary artwork basically warning the tyrants and radicals of the future about the mistakes of the tyrants and radicals of the past. Now, I don't read French, so I can't read what's on it, but it wasn't that hard to find something that tells you what the image is depicting. And if you look at it, it makes sense. Like that description does make sense. His, his whole point seems to be that it's a weird image. There's an Eye of Providence at the top, but that doesn't mean it was drawn by a mason. The Eye of Providence was a well-known and widely used Christian symbol. He's also quite interested in Phrygian caps, which there's a section of the video where he, he kind of describes why they're important a little bit more, but I, I honestly didn't have time. But I'm just gonna quickly put aside any confusion as to why there's Phrygian caps everywhere. In the late Roman imperial period, the Phrygian cap was the status of a freeman, a freed slave, somebody like that. So you'd wear a Phrygian cap to denote your status in society. Eventually, it became associated with the goddess of freedom, Libertas, and as American and French revolutionary movements began to embrace liberty as a central tenet, they started to use the Phrygian cap as a symbol. Now, he seems to think that this connects to the fact that it's shown on a relief of Mithras, who's a... Uh, ancient Indo-Iranian deity of light and justice and order. He was a very well-known and beloved god amongst the Persians and eventually even amongst the Romans. Now, I'm not sure exactly when the relief he showed is from, like when it was made, but it depicts Mithras slaying a bull and he's wearing a Phrygian cap. This is not weird. The Phrygian cap was extremely common everyday headwear in the classical era. We see depictions of it on Thracians, on Dacians, on Greeks, on Phrygians, on Persians, on Scythians. It was just a common piece of headwear. And by the way, that's not like we have people who tell us in textbooks that it was a very common piece of headwear. We have coins and we have statues and, and mosaics. Like we, we have the archeological evidence that this was used, but still trying to connect it with secret societies and the Illuminati and the Freemasons and all that. He shows another example of the Phrygian cap being depicted on the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is, of course, basically France's Declaration of Independence, their revolutionary constitution moment. I mean, as we just said, it was well known to be associated with movements about liberty. Are you wondering what this has to do with the video? 
same because at the moment that he's talking about it within the Secret Society segment, he just blows right past it. He just shows us some Phrygian caps and then moving swiftly along. There's also a comment that he makes about how the word founded is actually supposed to be the year they found the cities. Now this is pretty etymologically unsound. We, we could get into why that's ridiculous on its face, but let's talk about the etymology of the words found and founded. Because English, English is not a language. English is four languages in a trench coat. Founded, as in like to found something, comes from the Roman word fundus, which means base. So foundation, the foundation of a building, the base of a building, fundus, foundation, founded. But to have found something comes from find, and of course find comes from German finden. So Latin root for to found something, Germanic root for to have found something. Then we're on to Freemasons and Oddfellows, and I, I can't comment much on the Oddfellows, but I do know a good deal about the Freemasons. Deftly showing his complete understanding of Masonic symbolism, he shows us a map with a compass on it, implying that the map was drawn by the Freemasons, when compasses are a very common tool, in fact, a absolutely fundamentally necessary tool in cartography, and also the, the legend for mileage is inside the compass. It's an artistic way of showing the scale of the map. He also shows a, uh, a wood, what appears to be a woodcut or a woodcut print of uh, what is called Le Free Maçons. And it has, a, it has a little bit that is blown up, which is labeled Scott's Mason's Lodge, Devil Temple Bar JJ5. Now, of course, that must mean that they, they, were, they were devil worship, the devil temple? Like, oh my God, they're, they're, they're Satan worshipers. These were proto scots Rite Masons. Uh, the Scottish Rite didn't really coalesce until the 1800s, but early on there were people who were more interested in the occult and esoteric ideas, and they formed Scots Masons Lodges. Scottish Masonry really, really blew up in France. But the thing is, it wasn't the Devil's Temple Bar. It was the Devil's Tavern in the Temple Bar Room. And yes, the, the Devil Tavern is there. You, you, can, you can still see where it was. I don't think it's still the Devil's Tavern, but the building is still there and it is marked as being the old Devil's Tavern. He then goes on to suggest that it's strange that there are Freemason Lodges, Oddfellows Lodges, and Knights of Columbus Lodges in most major cities in the United States, saying, is that not suspicious or worthy of a note in the history books? It isn't suspicious and it's in the history books. First off, Freemasonry hit its peak in the 1950s when 4.5% of American men were Masons. That's a lot. This means that in a small town with just a thousand men, statistically it was likely that 45 of them would be Freemasons. That is absolutely enough people to make a lodge in that town necessary, especially pre-automobile. And then he goes on to say that obviously Freemasons in the modern day are not the same thing that they were a hundred years ago. My lodge has minutes going back to 1860 that tell us exactly what happened at the meeting. It's not different from what it is now. But he is mostly correct in saying that today, it's primarily just old dudes getting together once a month. We'd like to push back on a couple of things. We do have young people, and we also provide millions of dollars, millions upon millions of dollars per year to charities, schools, libraries, widows' homes, things like that. And I won't deny that some of the Scottish Rite stuff does seem a little weird at first glance. I haven't done most of it, I've just read about it, and I'll admit I have some reservations, and I do intend to go through with it just so I can understand what happens, but nothing of it feels sinister to me. Just a little weird. Back in the day, however, he claims that we were doing some pretty weird rituals. His evidence? Well, the first piece is literally an anti-Masonic cartoon. It was created in 1804 and the artist used a pseudonym, but it is obviously looking at it, it's a caricature. It's a very obvious caricature. And I gotta say, showing that picture as evidence without informing everybody that it's a caricature, that it's anti-Masonic, that it's a joke at the expense of the Masons is akin to lying. And then the next two he shows are further illustrations from Leo Taxil, which means it's time to talk about Leo Taxil. Taxil, whose real name was Marie-Joseph Gabriel Antoine Jogan Paget, was a French writer who really, really, really hated the Catholic Church. He even described the clergy as hedonistic creatures, which to me is ironic because he himself was French. I mean, pot meat kettle. So after writing a series of works calling Catholics just the worst possible things, in 1885, he publicly denounced his previous works and professed his conversion to Catholicism, 
and it went pretty well for him. And then he proceeded to write almost the same kind of thing about the Freemasons that he previously had been writing about the Catholics. And the church, because they hated Freemasonry, loved it. In fact, even today, becoming a Freemason is still technically grounds for excommunication in the Catholic Church. Excommunication in the Catholic Church means that your immortal soul doesn't go to heaven. They hate Freemasons that much. And keep in mind, this isn't your average Catholic. This is the, the official doctrine of the clergy. So I'm not saying that your average Catholic is, you know, horrible and evil. It's just, come on, guys. The, the guys upstairs need to be a little. But his most famous work on Freemasonry, alleged based on the writings of a an alleged Masonic satanic cult survivor named Diana Vaughn, they claimed that the Freemasons had an entire sect of Satanists and that the one that she was part of, the one that she was a victim of, was located in South Carolina. Taxel's work got him the opportunity to rub elbows with the highest of the clergy and it even got him a meeting with the Pope himself. But by the 1890s and particularly 1897, the public had more questions because Freemasonry was still a pretty well-known and common thing, even in France, although French Freemasonry is kind of weird and I personally don't consider it real Freemasonry, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. My reason is that to be a French Freemason, you don't have to believe in a, a deity. You don't have, you can be an atheist, which to me, it, it completely removes the entire point of Freemasonry. So the public at this point they had questions. They were wondering, and there were bishops in the United States saying this was a lie. There were prominent Freemasons saying this was a lie. And a whole bunch of American presidents had been Freemasons. So a lot of people wanted to know, is this real? Can you produce this Diana Vaughn? If you, ha if you spoke to her, clearly you, you must be able to show us her writings, her person, something along those lines. So in 1897, Taxil called a press conference. He told everybody that Diana Vaughn was gonna be there in person to tell her story. Instead, he got up on that stage and revealed to the entire crowd that all of it was a hoax. Of his own volition, by the way. This was not something he was forced to do. He chose to do this. He got up on stage and told everybody that he made the entire thing up and Diana Vaughn was the name of his typist who had allowed him to use the name. Everything that he did was basically just trying to conform to the confirmation bias of the Catholic Church regarding their opinions on Freemasonry. And he thanked them for helping him spread the hoax. It was all one big trick on the Catholic Church using the Freemasons as the bait. It's actually pretty impressive. And then in a 1906 interview with National Magazine, he confirmed yet again, a decade later, that it really was all a hoax. So the fact that Mind Unveiled used Taxil, who's like the most debunkable anti-Masonic writer of all time, is wild to me. It means he did no research into the images that he was putting on screen. I also wanna point out that the entire point he's making in all of this is that the Catholic Church is pulling the strings behind the Freemasons and the Illuminati and the Odd Fellows and all of these other secret societies. But I have to ask the question, if being a Freemason literally gets your place in heaven taken away from you, how is the Catholic Church pulling the strings? Like, in fact, they even started the Knights of Columbus as a competitive organization to Freemasonry for Catholic men. Well, according to, according to Mind Unveiled, it's all mind control. He says that the Freemasons, and of course the Odd Fellows, are the mind-controlled orphans of the Phoenician families. Considering we've roundly debunked the whole Irish connection and Phoenician thing, I, I just, I'm not even gonna bother, I'm hesitant to bother. Nonetheless, he claims that these are the top orphans of the club. Secret societies, he claims, have always been present in the Catholic Church. You see, according to him, these Freemasons were called knights. He says this while a illustration is on screen of a Templar knight communing over a crystal ball with Baphomet. Baphomet, of course, had absolutely nothing to do with the Knights Templar. What actually happened is that the Crusades were over and now what existed was in France, a Catholic military order that was absolutely wealthy enough to rival entire kingdoms. In fact, Philip IV, the King of France, was very deeply in debt to them. And the Catholic Church could no longer really control them now that the Crusades were over and they had nowhere to fight in the Middle East. So there was a concern that the Templars would maybe try their hand at politics. In order to solve both of these problems, King Philip IV with his debt and the Catholic Church with their rogue knights, they decided to work together and they created an entire fictional story and forced confessions of things about worshiping Satan and sodomy and being forced to make out with each other to become knights. Like there was no evidence of any of it 
All of it was eventually recanted because they were confessions given under duress, and it was used to either kill them or force them into exile. And then there were some who were allowed to join either a version of the Knights Templar that was allowed to continue in Portugal, or to go to one of the other crusading orders like the Teutonic Knights who were actually still crusading in Eastern Europe. And he's saying, he's, he's talking about all of this as he's showing an article on screen from Wikipedia about the suppression of the Knights Templar by King Philip. And what else does he support it with? More of Leo Taxil's illustrations. Illustrations, of course, based on the lies that the Catholics told about the Templars. But then he claims that the Templars became the Freemasons and the Illuminati. Now, I will say this. Freemasonry does hold that we are either the literal direct successors of the Knights Templar and that Freemasonry was founded by Templars in exile, or that it's more of a spiritual succession from the Knights Templar. Personally, when I go to do my PhD, this is what I want to do my thesis, my, my dissertation on, is I want to write about is this the true history of Freemasonry? And he does then go on to clarify that Freemasonry is not the Illuminati, which is correct. The Illuminati were an offshoot of Freemasonry whose goals were to corrupt Freemasonry until it became powerful enough and also, you know, followed their ideals so they could use it to try and topple the Catholic Church and secular governments to form a kind of a new world order that was atheist and not based upon, you know, the, the old world way of doing things. It failed, though there is an argument to be made about how similar French Freemasonry is with Illuminati ideals and the way the French Revolution differed from the American Revolution. So there's a discussion to be had there, but that's for another video. And then as, as all of this is going on, he's got a graphic on screen that claims that, uh, where, where is it here? Um, Zionism was created by the Jesuits. The Jesuits are Masonic, no. And that all of this, this whole thing is built on Babylonian Kabbalistic Masonic doctrine. He does not elaborate. He then goes on to claim that the Odd Fellows were formed to educate the orphans of the Phoenician families while simultaneously finding it odd that they ran orphanages. He leaves out the rest of their mission, which is visit the sick, relieve the distressed, and educate the orphan. Occam's razor, dude. They were just taking care of orphans. That was it. <laughs> What's more likely, that this is all veiled symbolism about some sort of ancient Catholic cabal that overtook the Irish religion, and that there's, you know, that they symbolized these secret societies of orphans as orphans of this thing, and that then they started orphanages to hide it? Or, or is it more likely that they just started orphanages? Because it was a good thing to do, because there were orphans. And then he goes on to repeat the same nonsense about no construction photos and shows more of Leo Taxil's drawings. And at this point, it's starting to feel more like deception than ignorance, but I'm not a mind reader. And with literally no evidence except his own cynicism, he goes on to claim that this, ha this can't possibly just be the odd fellows doing this out of the good of their hearts, right? It can't. And I know that there's gonna be somebody who comments at this point in the video and goes, yeah, well, uh, you know, maybe you should watch his video on orphan trains and things. And I, I mean, I already, I, I've already explained why so much of the foundation of that is BS that I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that. My whole point in doing this is to take out the legs so that all of the other stuff built upon the foundation crumbles. Mind Unveiled's argument is fundamentally wrong about almost everything to the extent that it's not worth getting into the mud with the later stuff, but you know what? If I have to, I will. Don't test me. I am a man with far too much time who makes money doing this. But of course, he immediately supports his argument with the idea of orphan trains, which were a real thing. People did, in fact, take orphans from the big cities where there was basically no prospects for them, and oftentimes these were the children of immigrants who died in the factories or, you know, of sickness or simply gave them up because they couldn't afford to take care of their children. And the thought was, hey, if we ship these kids off into the suburbs, you know, maybe they can find better homes. And then they thought, all right, well, what about the Midwest? We can send them out there too. And of course, Mind Unveiled categorizes this as basically them abducting children for slave labor. But the reality is that when you, when you study what happened, when you look at the evidence, when you, you know, read the documents about these orphans' lives, there were pretty mixed results. Some definitely did end up being just farm laborers and people took them on and did not take good care of them, but a lot of them also found very loving homes. But there's another problem here, which is that he's connecting this to the Odd Fellows, and there is no evidence that the Odd Fellows were involved with orphan trains. And the evidence actually suggests the opposite. 
The orphan trains were typically taking people and trying to set them up with families. The Odd Fellows were putting kids up in orphanages. These are different concepts, different missions, different goals, and different groups. He then notes that it's strange that foundling hospitals, which are basically just early orphanages, are so often constructed in old world architecture. And he shows us a couple examples. One is the Foundling Hospital in London, England, which is the old world. The other is Bremer Sanatorium in Sokolowsko, Poland, which you'll note is also the old world. So what he's saying here is that it's weird that Foundling Hospitals have old world architecture. And the only examples he provided were in Europe. And then he goes on to mention the Monteagle House Hotel, which is in Niagara Falls, and obviously has no construction photos because daguerreotype photography, there's probably one copy and it's probably not on the internet. And that's of course because it was constructed over the course of seven years from 1848 to 1855 and commercial cameras capable of doing negative style copies would not be on the market widely until the last year of its construction. By the way, seven years is really not even all that fast for like a four or five story building. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm also gonna just not even address the section about postcards that show babies in cabbages, because he goes on to claim that babies used to grow out of cabbages, basically. And he also claim it's it's not necessarily that. He, he shows these incubators that were shown off at the World's Fair, uh, and the thing about the incubators was that was a major advancement in medical technology for premature or sick children, because you could keep a baby alive a lot better in an incubator than you could just in a blanket. Also, cabbages were associated with fertility in medieval Europe, and medical modern medical science does back up that cabbages are actually very good for pregnant women because they have a lot of nutrients that help with pregnancy. And then, of course, there's the argument he makes that playing pin the tail on the donkey is a Masonic initiation ritual. It's not at all. Also, you can't become a Mason until you're 18 or 21 in most places. Uh, and by that, I mean that it, most places it's 21, some it's 18. And also, we have Demolay. There's an entire group an organized group for the children of Masons to kind of get them into Freemasonry as children. It's like Boy Scouts. So, so why would we need pin the tail on the donkey when we have an actual thing for it? I would also address his claims that the Civil War was made up, uh, but we already explained why the doctored photos exist, and that's his main argument. And also, I have my great-great-great-grandfather's conscription papers from the war. So unless you're gonna accuse me of faking them, he then goes on to talk about empty cities in these photos and just dismisses the entire long exposure time argument without, without actually addressing it. Just says it doesn't matter. Also, about half a dozen of the examples he gives on screen have people, carriages, things in them, just not many. It's also important to note that we don't know what time of day these photos were taken, and it is possible that somebody just got up really early to go take pictures before the city was bustling. In fact, if your goal was to capture a cityscape with as few people as possible so you could see the streets and everything, it would make sense that you would get up at the crack of dawn to do it. And then he also shows a bunch of cities and says like, in this year, usually a decade or two earlier, this city only had a few thousand people, so why are there so many buildings only 10 years later? But most of the pictures he's showing are gold rush cities during the gold rush, so of course they grew rapidly. People found out there was gold there, people moved, and they had to build cities around the people. And then finally we come to the, the most famous argument about Tartaria, in my opinion, which is the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The classic claim is that the buildings we see in pictures of the World's Fair were already there and that they were torn down afterwards to hide Tartaria. Which again begs the question, when did the Tartarians disappear? When is all of this supposed to have happened? Because 1893 isn't that long ago. Once again, I will point out that we didn't tear down all the other examples of Tartarian architecture that he used throughout his video, and they didn't even tear down the museum that they built. So if the Tartarians built the entire white city, and we took down the entire white city to hide the Tartarians, why did we leave one of the buildings standing? In fact, why did we put extra effort into making sure that building was actually made out of stone and not just wood coated in plaster to look like masonry? Mind Unveiled snidely asks us, these architectures seen in these photos of the World's Fair in America during the early 1900s, it was the 1800s, it was the late 1800s actually, there were a few in the early 1900s, but the majority of them were in the late 1800s, were all just built in a short two to three year span with no construction photos, and that they were all built from wooden pallets? My friends, there are construction photos. There's a lot of construction photos. 
I don't know where the argument that there's no construction photos is coming from. The, and it's not like they're hard to find. You, you just Google 1893 World's Fair construction photos and they're there. And I know Mind Unveiled doesn't do his research because he couldn't even figure out whether or not I was a real Freemason, despite the fact that I do in fact show up in the fall issue of the Pennsylvania Freemason from last year. <sighs> That's from the response video. Although he then goes on to say, you know, or at least not a real Freemason, like, you know, a Scottish Rite. And I'm like, I, dude, half my, most of my lodge is Scottish Rite Masons. And also, it's not like a difficult thing to do. You just find out when a fourth degree ceremony is happening and then you pay like 20 bucks and you go. There's. The only requirement to getting into the Scottish Rite is being a third degree Mason. But yeah, my point about the World's Fair issue, there are photos. His entire argument is there's not photos. Discussion over. Now I do have some observations to make very quickly, which are basically all of Mind Unveiled's evidence that he gives. Every picture, everything he says there's no construction photos of, there's no record of it. I was able, usually within minutes, to find evidence. Why is it that basically everything he says turns out to be entirely explainable, and yet he claims he's doing all this research. Related to that, why do mainstream historians require photographic evidence, documents, archaeological proof, all these different pieces for us to be believed, but we can just take Sarian, Donnelly, and McDerry at their word? Now, I could go through literally every point made by Donnelly, McDerry, and Sarian, and I could find evidence of every building they say there's no construction photos or record of, and I could find manuscripts for every allegedly forged document. But that would take weeks. So instead of doing that, and confident in the fact that this video has provided enough evidence to show that, at the very least, Mind Unveiled isn't doing his research, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it here. Tartaria, at least this version, has been undone. Now, this video that you just watched was the result of uh, well, about 70 hours of research and me reading through the insane, incoherent ramblings of several madmen. If you'd like to support us as we continue to do that, because let's be realistic, none of our videos are about things that completely make sense, you can help us by subscribing to us on Patreon for just $1 a month or by becoming a member of this here YouTube channel, which will also provide you with an ad-free experience. If you want to support us while also rocking some sick gear, you can check out our merch store, thelorelodge.shop. And if you feel like drinking some bean juice to start your day, we got coffee too from Tableau Roasting Company, and the link is in that description. It is a blend I designed myself, and it is very, very delicious. It is the only coffee I will drink anymore. If you want to catch discussions about these kinds of topics that we have live every week, you can do that at 7 p.m. on Sunday, every weekend at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You can also check out our two other channels that we have videos on right now, those being The Weird Bible and The History Hut. Very similar content to our podcasts, and they both will be getting their own Friday-style videos just like this. And if you want to keep up with what we're doing and, you know, updates about stuff other than just YouTube, you can join our Discord, where you can talk with other viewers and with Aiden and myself, because we do hop in there every now and then when we have a free moment. <laughs> ha! A free yeah. moment? And that is at bit.ly slash join the lodge. Once again, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.